the more things you can get away yeah, with. Yeah, the more things you can get away with, the more political capital you have. It's a matter is an obvious issue of power, at least beliefs about what your power enables you to do. The psalmist protagonist champion, champion a pragmatic approach. The word is derived from the Greek word meaning deed. Not only was that in the written part of the textbook, where else did you find it? You found it you know, defined in the side margins, too. Just as a word of advice, those key terms will typically show up again. That's why the author does that. Now let me read. What would a sophist such as Protagoras argue? Why would such as Protagoras argue that there's no good reason for anyone to be ethnocentric? I should have said why. That's why. That's what was wrong with that. It should have said why would a sophist such as? Or it should have said what would a sophist such as Protagoras? I guess that still works. I think I should have said why, though. Now, be sure to explain your position. And, and is it wise? To, and, and it is wise to consider a specific example to illustrate. I like this answer, so I'm going to read it to you. Protagoras would argue that there is no good reason to be ethnocentric because no single person or culture has correct views. For example. It is irrational to consider Burka's wrong and Bikini's right. That judgment depends solely, according to the sophists, on the, the culture uh, uh, or country in which uh, the article was used or, or worn would have been good. That was a direct example. Ethnocentrism is to believe in the inherent superiority of your own culture. Protagoras says that's mere arrogance. Every culture tends to think its ways are superior, but it's because it's seeing itself through its own biased eyes. It is seeing its own culture through its own biased eyes. Keep in mind, there's a lot of older people that think, what about you whippersnappers? We're entitled. Yeah, and also you're, you dress like bums. I wouldn't have gone out dressed like that. My step-granddaddy, he was a puss bag, I will admit, in so many ways. But he wore a suit every damn day of his life. I mean, he, I mean, he dressed, I mean, he smelled like cigarettes and was kind of crusty a lot of the time. But yeah, he always did his best to dress the way that he believed was a way to show respect to himself and others. Now, most of the younger generation doesn't believe that that's a way you show respect to others. And that might be one of the reasons why we are more, in their opinion, lax about the way we dress. By the way, they said that about my generation, too. And guess what I sometimes say about your generation? Yeah, the same kind of thing. These bums wearing sweatpants to class and so forth. Now, honestly, if I came from another time and place, I would see things entirely differently. That's what the sophists argue. But no person's beliefs, dress style, language, or any kind of preferences related to culture or otherwise are, inherent, are inherently better or worse, according to this view. It is all a matter of culture. And I do want to extrapolate on this to something that the author does not explicitly address. You notice that when we talk about that notion of might makes right, it all comes down to an issue of power. Everything comes down to an issue of power. But keep this in mind. For cultural relativism, ladies and gentlemen, the issue is also a matter of what? I don't have to put my notes up on the board because I gave them to you already. I think it's more worthwhile to talk about them. Now, what does cultural relativism claim? And why would I say 
that the cultural relativist observations come down to a matter of power, too. Uh, Mr. Anderson. With the cultural relativism, is that like what we're talking about, I think, Wednesday, when it's like, based on your culture, you're going to view something as how, well, like, for example, Christianity, it was dominantly a westernized thing, so it, they try to make it seem like uh, Jesus Christ would have been a white man versus being someone of Dr. Sandler. Yeah. So basically, when you say it's an issue of power, it's like what group can influence others more? Like, if, say, if, since we are in a westernized world, um, people who are Caucasian they have more power, so their their beliefs get pushed onto other cultures more so. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna state it state this a little bit first though. Right. Beliefs and values are determined by the culture that one is in. Or to put it another way, values are not objectively out there in the world to be discovered. Values, values are cultural constructs. Values are always cultural constructs. Now, the, according to the cultural relativist, the person who accepts the view, the relativist would say, many people fail to see that their culture is what? Flawed. Yeah, well, I won't say flawed. Your culture is merely one among many cultures. And if you had sort of like a long view of things, that is, if you, if you try to see other cultures through the eyes of people in those cultures, not only would you recognize that the reason why you tend to see your own culture is inherently right, you know, because you're seeing through those cultural eyes, you would also see why those people tend to see their cultures as inherently right. And it's, kind, and it's just this simple. It's because you're mired in your culture. You're knee deep in your culture. You were raised in a cultural setting. You learned your language through your culture, etc., etc. So it's no wonder people tend to see their own culture's ways not just as right for them, but as inherently right. And it's partly because when we see it, we're looking through what Ruth Benedict, I want to put her name on the board, she's quoted in the text. But how many of you also know where else you might encounter Ruth Benedict? I sent you a reading packet. And granted, I recommend you take a look at it whether you decide to write this 100 page essay or not. Or 100 page. 100 point essay. Yeah, oh. Yeah, 100 point essay. Yeah, that's a, that's a thesis there. But no, 100 point essay. It's, four, it's a four to six page essay, 100 point essay. Ruth Benedict's essay is one of those two essays. She argues for cultural relativism and contends that whenever we judge other cultures, I'll quote her here, when we judge other cultures, we do so through the bias. This is a this is not a direct quote, but it's a very close paraphrase. When we judge other cultures, we do so through the bias of our own what? Experiences? Yeah. yeah. Well, she calls it cultural eyes. That's the metaphor she uses. We do so through the bias of our own cultural eyes. In other words, when we judge other people's practices and beliefs to be inherently wrong, we are implicitly assuming that our own ways happen to be right. 
and I want to be absolutely offensive here to get your attention. I find it comical that people who rail about burkas have no problem with very conservative Christian women being forced to wear long skirts in the middle of summer and having to wear one of those nets on their head. Now there's a reason why in some cultures and religions people cover up their body. One of the reasons is out of respect for themselves but also respect for others and in some cases it's also how they show respect for three letter word? So how they show respect for God. Now of course it might not make sense to whom? Might not make sense to someone outside of those cultures. As a matter of fact, outside of those cultures, we might say that it is sexist. Well, keep in mind, Hasidic Jewish men are completely covered too. They have to have those curls. You've seen them, right? They have to wear those Amish-esque black hats all the time, and it is hot as Hades in summer, I imagine, to dress like that in the middle of New York City. I hear people ripping on how sexist Islam is, but for some reason I never hear people ripping on Hasidic Jews. And perhaps that might be because why? It might be, it might be because of those people we deem to be worthy and those who we deem to be unworthy. In, if you're in a culture where Muslims are branded the enemy and Jews are branded the victims and the good guys, it's kind of no wonder we have such attitudes. And we're judging Muslims all the time. But nobody's going to judge Hasidic Jews for having the same kind of what look like sexist and archaic practices. I don't happen to think any of them are inherently wrong. I happen to think they're just what? There's all kinds of different ways to dress. Actually, I'm lying a little bit. I'll tell you why. I am not a full-blown relativist, but I do appreciate this part of it. The beliefs that we tend to hold will be relative. But here's an example of why I don't agree with them. I happen to think, for example, that some of our taboos are not good for us. I think that our taboos about covering up the body and about certain things being lewd isn't necessarily psychologically healthy for us. This is why we fetishize and objectify the body. You know what I'm talking about? What, is the, what would be the big deal about a nude beach? I wouldn't want to go to one myself. People might laugh at me. Good. That was, that was my aim there. I want to in, in, inject a little bit of humor there. But the fact is, the only reason why some... How, what was that last summer about? What, wasn't some beach in Ocean City was talking about going on natural? Is that it? And of course, people came out of the woodwork about how awful the idea was. The thing is, because of the way I was raised, I was trained to objectify the female body. It's no wonder most males are sexist and don't even know it, even if they have been politically correctly trained not to be sexist. The female body in our taboos about body parts. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You might talk about this in a SOS class, sociology class. I think if I had been in Europe where the human body, you know, where people walked around nude on the beach, it wouldn't be a big deal, you know. My son wouldn't be going into magazines and so forth. Oh yeah, kids don't use magazines anymore. <laughs> Now we have what? Yeah, we have the sound of one hand typing, which is what the, the not so the crude joke is. But it's no wonder that people fetishize the body. I think we would actually be a lot better off in the long run if we didn't. We would probably have healthier relationships with one another. 
Our relationships with one another would not be reduced to a sexual transaction. You know what I'm talking about? Actually, if you don't know what I'm talking about, good. But I think there would be healthier practices that would lead to healthier ways of relating to one another. Which actually suggests ought to suggest to you that I'm certainly not a what? I'm certainly not a relativist. Because a relativist literally believes what? That no beliefs, values, or practices are inherently superior to any others. To make the claim that I think that we would live better, healthier lives with different ways of doing things I'm actually suggesting that I believe that there are some things that are absolutely better for us. Even if I can't necessarily do what? Fully prove them, ex explain them, or, you know, nail them all down, if you will. But if you believe that there are certain things that are better than others, that would lead to, lead to better lives, then you're not really a relativist. Yeah, so Peters. How does science interact with relativism? So there are some beliefs that are just kind of out there. They're balloons. There is nothing tying them down. You can be like, oh yeah, within that culture, that balloon is fine. But if you have something that's specifically nailed down by science and cultures disagree, then what do you do there? Uh, can you give me a concrete example and then I'll see if I can answer your question. Uh, it's difficult because it's kind of a floating question. Well, think, think a minute because I have, I won't call it an answer to your question, but it's, I think, down that alley. I don't yeah, you want to go with that? Oh, hold that thought one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruth Benedict was a social scientist. Specifically, what area of social science? Does anyone know? She was an American anthropologist. And by the way, this ideal of anthropology came out of the 19th century. That if you're truly going to study a culture and study it in earnest, as an objective scientist would, what can't you bring into your study? Your biases. Yeah, you can't bring in your biases. You see, social scientists prior to that revolution in anthropology would go into a culture of native people, assuming that those people were the P-word. They would assume that they were primitive and were ignorant and stupid and didn't have it right. And typically, they were going in there to try to turn them all into what? Christians. Christians. You know, the white man's burden, as it used to be called. Well, according to this ideal of objectivity that good social science actually demands, you can't go into another culture and earnestly study it if you are assuming all of the time that these people are somehow wrong and inferior. Because if you were to see them through, what time is it, by the way? Uh, 38. Yeah. If you were to see things through their eyes, their way of doing things would make what? Sense. Yeah, it would make perfect sense. Their way of doing things would make perfect sense. Now, let me give a couple of examples, and this is along the line of the textbook. Here, are, Ruth Benedict gives a ton of examples. They are all worth looking at. But one of the examples she looks at is she looks at homosexuality and what we would call gender now, even though she doesn't use the word gender. She says, if you went back to the ancient Athens of Plato and Socrates, you would find that homosexual relationships weren't just approved, they were expected for a healthy aristocratic male. And by the way, she kind of overplays her hand just a little bit there. Because an aristocratic male was expected to behave bisexually. 
In other words, he was a householder who would get married and have children. But his closest relationships were with Man. males. Typically, yeah, yeah. Typically, NAMBLA territory. NAMBLA is an acronym for the North American Man Boy Love Association. <laughs> In other words, you would have a 45 year old male who would take a 13 or 14 year old lad under his wing. And that would include intellectual banter, it would also include sexuality. We would call that peed. Yeah, we would yeah, we would call that peed behavior. But keep in mind, in that culture, that was normal and expected. And if you didn't do those things, you were seen as kind of off or weird. Now, you'll notice that norms in our culture concerning homosexuality are changing a little bit too. I would say, albeit slowly. You'll notice that most of us, many of us don't see homosexuality as a problem. And I can say one of the reasons why things are changing is because of the science behind it. Most of us realize it's not a what? Choice. choice. Now to even care whether it's a choice or not kind of implies that if it weren't a choice you would see something wrong with it. I don't happen to believe it's a choice because I never chose to be straight, to use that cliche. I just am. I didn't choose it. But I do imagine that if I came from another cultural setting, if I had come from the ancient Greek world of Plato and Socrates, there's a good chance that I would have been institutionalized. Because who's institutionalized? Crazy people. Oh, I don't mean that kind of institution. We are all basically trained within the institutions of our culture. It's just in our culture, heterosexuality is considered normal and therefore right. If I came from a culture that had institutionalized bisexuality, I would bet you at least even money that I might have bisexual tendencies. Because I was basically institutionally thought taught what? There's something wrong with being gay. Because you'll know, even in the sitcoms that were gay friendly when I was growing up, how many of you have heard of the sitcom Are You Being Served? It was from the 70s and early 80s. They used to show it on PBS. But there was a flamboyantly gay uh, male named Mr. Humphreys who worked in menswear. But he had the whole stereotypical thing, are you free, Mr. Humphrey? He says, I'm free. Oh. Now what I mean is, we have the stereotype of the homosexual male there. Now you notice they weren't quote unquote mean to Mr. Humphrey, but he was treated like he was, oh, isn't he cute? That is condescending as hell. I want to make that blunt. Now you'll notice that was, that was what I would call gay friendly for the time period. And even if you look at, are they bringing back that sitcom, Will and Grace? Yes. I hate Will and Grace. I will go down the record saying that. My wife liked it. And it was always the one in the background. And it was annoying. Now one of the reasons I dislike Will and Grace is because of the same problem as with Mr. Humphreys. Oh, aren't they cute? Just one more way to be condescending to gay males. And also one more way to stereotype gay males. There's plenty of gay males out there who what? Don't fit the stereotype. They're in NFL locker rooms and they could kick my ass in a minute. Not Mr. Humphreys. But in other words, we set up these... Mr. Humphreys could, I don't think. But yeah, if I had come from a, from a different scenario, I might be a very different person. I realized that, yeah. Um, I thought of an example now. Is this a good time to interject? Heck yeah. Okay, so two cultures, flyover country culture and coast culture, issue climate change, science says it's happening, 
the moral like belief of the flyover people is that it's not happening. Coast believable people think it's occurring. Mr. Peters is giving me a very multifaceted question here to deal with. Mr. Peters is asking the question, what about when there are clearly false beliefs that are being held by people simply because it's a normal point of view in their culture? In other words, a scientific point of view. Now, I'm not going to get political about this intentionally. But I will talk about a parallel example. And this is to help you guys out who are thinking about writing this essay. The philosopher James Rachels will argue against cultural relativism. His essay is in that reading packet. Now, Rachels gives an example. He says, suppose you met a culture of people who believed that the earth was flat, and they believed it in earnest. Would their believing that the earth was flat make the earth any more flat? The answer is no. Now, the point that Rachel is trying to make here is that no matter how much someone might believe relativism in all of its form to be the case. The moral of Rachel's story is this. If you understood his illustration of the flat earthers, he says, the, no matter how many people believe the earth was flat, would not magically make the earth flat. In other words, there are quote unquote facts about the world. And it is possible to get things wrong. We wouldn't say that the truth the facts about the world are relative, but we would say that what people believe the facts are is relative to perspective. Do you get the distinction? The facts about the world are not relative, but what people take to be the facts about the world will be relative to perspective. In other words, it's possible to get the facts wrong. Mr. Anderson, do you send us the readings on in an email? I sent it, what day did I send that? Mm. Wednesday via D2L, is that when I sent it? Yeah, I sent it Wednesday via D2L. If you didn't receive it, you know, shoot me an email as it were. Now, this does leave something very, this lead, does leave an issue open, and we'll talk about Mike Makes Right on Monday. Socrates' homework will be due Wednesday. I was going to say that anyway, but the, the because we'll finish up this chapter on Monday. <laughs> that will be chapter four. We'll be due Wednesday. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not too difficult for Rachel's to convince us of this. However, most relativists do not say that the facts are relative. Most relativists make the claim that our values are what are relative, not the facts. Now, if a person believes that you show respect to other people by covering your body, whereas somebody else believes you show respect to others by letting it flap in the breeze, and that's what their culture says, is according to a value relativist, is either of those ways better or worse intrinsically? No, because there are no intrinsically better or worse values. Because according to these kinds of relativists, all values are human constructs. And the reason why you are likely to believe your own cultures 
and we came full circle. 